Hello, everyone. And on behalf of the Julio Fine Arts Gallery at Loyola University, Maryland, and the Fine Arts Department at Loyola, I would like to welcome you all to this lunchtime artist talk with Akia Brian Brown. I am Megan Rakepsel, the director of the Julio Fine Arts Gallery, and I'm so very pleased to be joined today by my colleague and professor of, of photography, Heather Braxton, who will be introducing our speaker today. But before we dive in, uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes from our end. Um, first, I would love to invite you all to connect with the Julio Fine Arts Gallery on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We are at Julio Art Gallery at all of those platforms. Um, and I, we hope that you'll do that so that you can keep up with all of the wonderful programming announcements that we make there um, and all that we're doing to keep our community connected to the arts. Uh, you can also find out more about the gallery on our website at julioartgallery.com or email us at julioartgallery at loyola.edu. We welcome your thoughts and your feedback. In the coming months, we will have a few more exciting virtual programs, so please keep an eye out for the announcements of those programs coming soon. The gallery is supported in part by the Maryland State Arts Council. To discover more about the Maryland State Arts Council and how they impact Maryland, visit msac.org. This program is also supported in part by the Lily and Christine Sane Fine Arts Programmatic Support Fund. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, while we cannot see your faces or hear your voices, we really do want to hear from you. So we highly encourage you to submit your questions uh, throughout the program using the Q&A function. And we will do our best to get to all of the questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Heather. Hello. Um, so today I am introducing Akia Brion Brown, and I wanted to just give a little bio. Um, Akia is a visual journalist, photographer, writer, curator, and researcher. Um, her work has received the Visual Task Force Award from the National Association of Black Journalists. Her work is also featured in the Smithsonian's Ralph Rensler Collection and Archives. She was announced the 2018 winner of the Duke University Center of Photography for Documentary Arts Collection Award as the 2008 documentar Documentarian of Color. Her series, Black Picket Fences, was acquired for their permanent collection and is on preserve at the David M. Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library. She was nominated for PDN's 30, which is Photo District News 2018, New and Emerging Photographers to Watch. Brown was also named the 2019 Janet and Walter Sondheim Artscape Prize winner, juried by Layla Ali, um, William Pau Haida, and Regina Basha. In 2019, Akia Brion co founded Shades Collective and in 2020 co-founded Diary of an Angry Black Woman. Women. Uh, Akia received her BFA in 2018 from Maryland Institute College of Art in the dual degree program of Photography and Humanities. She is originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, and currently lives and works in Baltimore, Maryland. So without any more hesitation, here is Akia. Hello, uh, thanks so much, Heather, for the introduction. Um, and thank you all for having me today. I'm super excited to talk to you about my practice and my work. Um, I am, for this presentation, going to sort of give an overview of where I started and where I am now in terms of um, my work and how that has developed. Um, I think a lot of that is really important in terms of just understanding my own growth as an artist and then how the work developed. Um, much of my work has been influenced by my geographic setting, culturally, socially, financially, um, and navigating through my own identity. So I really um, want to show you all where I started, um, actually really starting in high school, and then coming up until now because it's been um, quite the journey. So if there's any questions, um, please let me know, um, put them in the chat. Um, if it needs to be answered in the middle of the presentation, that's also fine. Um, so I am going to share my screen. All 
right, and can, can you all hear me right now? You can hear me, okay. Okay, so actually to share my screen for some reason, because of the permissions I have, I have to quit Zoom and then reopen. So I will be back in 10 seconds. <laughs> Johnny, can you rename IKEA again? Okay, great. All right, so um, clearly I'm not the most technologically savvy millennial, so <laughs> got that out of the way. Um, okay, can you all see my screen? Great. All right, so um, my name is uh, Akia Brian. Um, so I am a photographer, curator, writer, and um, researcher. I am going to turn this down. So just to give an overview of my education, um, I graduated high school in Ellicott City, Maryland, which is in Howard County. And I actually, uh, my senior year moved out to California um, and went to a semester school. I went to college at MICA and I was a major in photography and humanities and a minor in sustainability and social practice. So I just wanted to start with the work that I was making early on because it does sort of come back full circle to the concepts and the themes that I currently explore in my work. So this is something that I began um, my senior year of high school and this project was titled Project X, where I documented a lot of my friends and sort of explored on the other side of this project the ethnicities that had been attributed to people based on just looking at them. So at the time I was thinking a lot about what it meant to be navigating in my own skin um, and really thinking about a lot of the questions and preoccupations I found that people had with trying to figure out if I was biracial or not. Um, and so I started to really explore how other people were identifying themselves and then how other people identified them based on just looking at them. So this was a series of portraits that I did. Um, at the time, I was also exploring uh, documenting women. Um, that's something that I've done a lot. So I was documenting my friends often um, and this is just with um, 35 millimeter jealous and silver prints. Um, so very early on, I was very interested in portraiture, very interested in exploring women within these portraits. And I was using my friends to explore this. At the time, I had no real language for what I was doing and I had no idea what I was doing, but I was doing it, um, which I think is where everything starts is just by starting. Um, of course, you can see a lot of the women that I am documenting also do not look like me. Um, so this sort of ties into some work that I go into later, but I just want to give some context into who I was surrounded by um, as much as where I was in. So again, we're still in high school. I'm exploring a lot of things with the female body and I wasn't sure if I was solely going to be exploring this with photography. So my work does go through a few different avenues of me talking through a lot of these themes, but sort of exploring with different mediums and also trying to reuse materials as much as possible. Um, so here, I this is still in high school. I made <clears throat> a life-size, um, 
pyramid where one person is able to enter the space. Um, and this was made out of recycled cardboard. <clears throat> so another part of my practice has been trying to figure out how to do it in a sustainable way in terms of my environmental contributions. So beginning at MICA, I was a double major in photography and humanities. And within my focus in humanities, I focused a lot on French feminist theory, critical race theory, and African-American feminist theory. So this comes up a lot in my work, um, but I am going to sort of start at my freshman year and show you all how I eventually came to make the work that I make now. So freshman year, I was still exploring portraiture. Um, I wasn't thinking too deeply about it in terms of relating my thoughts for why I wanted to make the work and then the final product with the work. So there is a lot of disconnect at this time in the themes that I'm exploring and then how they're translating in the images. But I wanted to give some insight as to where I started in terms of this portraiture. So I was experimenting a lot, um, using a lot of digital manipulation. I also was still exploring a lot of things with my own identity, the body, and using painting to do that as well. Um, though I, it was pretty much the last time I used painting. Sculpture was also another form that I was exploring. And at the time it was very encouraged to be um, moving through a lot of different mediums. So you can see here, a lot of my practice is very disjointed. Um, I have a lot of things that I want to talk about, but really no cohesive um, way of how to do it and how to communicate it. I think that that sort of shifted a bit with this series here. Um, so this is a series where I explored the sort of destruction and really disappearance of the Owings Mills Mall. So if you are not familiar with Owings Mills, it is a suburb in Baltimore County. Um, it is predominantly an African American community and began primarily as an African American community. But in recent years, there's been a lot of development, which has led to um, a lot more um, mixed demographic financially and racially as well. But there used to be a mall there, which is no longer there. And I documented the um, sort of the changes within the mall. Um, the mall was open for about three or four years with only one store open in the entire mall. And it was a huge contrast to different commercial areas like Towson or Columbia, which had a, a much larger uh, white demographic. And this is sort of when I actually started to think about the opportunities and the privileges afforded to different communities outside of the city and really looking at suburbs and location and really how the people who inhabited those spaces also determined the uh, opportunities and luxuries sort of afforded to those communities. And it really started with uh, me documenting this mall. So these were just point and shoot photos. Um, I just had a little 35 millimeter camera that I was taking around. Um, but this one was really my first project where I started to think about narrative storytelling in terms of what I was really interested in exploring. So this happens a lot um, as well, where I start thinking about how I can be using uh, photography itself to start communicating a lot of things. And I sort of simplified my practice down and specifically just focused on light and color and shape and looking at the relationship between those images. And it really helped me figure out how I wanted to approach um, creating imagery and how to do so in a way that was also intriguing. So again, this is all still my freshman year. Um, and at the same time, I am originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. So at this time, I was really focusing a lot on how to communicate the issues that I was dealing with internally in terms of dealing with losing a place. Um, a lot of themes around displacement, um, environmental disasters. 
And I was looking a lot at the archive as something that would help me through that. At the time, of course, I was not in New Orleans. I was here in Baltimore, but I was still very much rooted in figuring out how to work through my own pain and trauma around having to really um, leave that place. So I actually started looking through my personal archives and ended up finding that a lot of the images I had taken myself um, just on walks, um, just around New Orleans, I actually found that there were a lot of other images that I had come across completely unconnected that were photographed of the same place. So the digital photo behind this image is just a quick um, image that I shot. And then two years later, I found a photo in a group of um, Kodachrome slides that I found. And it was photographed in the exact same area um, down in the French Quarter. And I started really thinking about the relationship between images that other people take and the images that I take, which sort of um, really, I would like to say, is the foundation of my interest in the archive in a deeper way. So it was not for anything um, related to how I use the archive now, uh, but it very much was the tipping point that I started to change how I looked at um, archival imagery and the role of the archive. So I start to play a lot with these images that I'm taking and then images that I'm, I've found, um, thinking how I can sort of mess around with these images, whether it be digitally and physically and sort of start having conversations about these things, but doing it in a way that is more subtle. I think something I've always been very interested in is having the audience do just as much work as I'm doing in terms of figuring out what it is that I'm talking about. And I think it's very important to recognize your own, um, your own existence and the body you occupy and the experiences that you have because the way you're going to inform um, and, and dissect work is going to be different. So this was a huge turning point for me um, with these archival images. Getting into sophomore year, I had absolutely no idea what I was making work about. I was feeling very frustrated with my experience in undergrad. Um, I did not really feel like I was getting any feedback on my work. I didn't feel like there was any interest in what I was talking about. Um, this was during a period where I was very seriously considering leaving school. And something that I questioned a lot was accessibility. Um, there was a huge disconnect in my ability to conceive of work and my ability to actually make the work, uh, both for financial constraints and really not having the time. So this project, I started exploring what accessibility means, especially in a digital age. And as someone working in a lens-based media, I started looking at Google. Um, so you can pretty much now on <laughs> Google Maps in the, with the satellite images, you can see anywhere in the world. So here is the Louvre. And I really started to question um, what accessibility meant in this digital age. And a lot of these works are just screen captures of images that are readily available on um, Google. And I just explore different places that were of interest to me at the time that I didn't have the physical ability to go see but with um, the software I was able to access. So it was a, a really nice moment of me not even using the camera to make work and just making work by really using what was readily available. But it had me thinking a lot more about accessibility financially, um, thinking about who has access to spaces and what that means for me as an artist. So once again, I started thinking about how I could approach this and what I wanted to talk about, what was interesting to me and what I was able to actually um, really jump into in a deeper way. So I came back to the archive and I came back to my family's images and I started working with, I was working with cyanotypes a lot at that time. 
And I started thinking about how to just engage myself in a deeper way that was also connected to different practices that my family had also done. Quilting is one of those. So with these images, I printed some family images onto um, fabric and the fabric was treated with cyanotype. So the images were transferred onto this fabric and then I ended up sewing them together to make a large quilt, which is a direct reference to a lot of African-American history and the history with quilting, which I won't get into right now, but this is where I really started to connect um, history to a more contemporary conversation, which I will get into a little bit later, but I wanted to show you all where this sort of starts. So I'm also thinking at this time a lot about space. I'm thinking a lot about how to be creating work with not a lot of access to resources. So this is where I begin to play with space. And um, these are acrylic backings, acrylic um, images that had uh, been used at Urban Outfitters, which is where I was working at the time. Like I, this is my sophomore year of college. Um, so I actually reused these and was playing a lot with light and how I could activate a space and how wor my work could be in conversation with a space itself. Um, so I'm really using at this point, whatever is accessible to me um, to try and figure out what I like to make, how I like to make it, how I like to display it. So this is happening a lot during this time. So getting into junior year, I start to become a bit more, um, I would say intentional with what I'm talking about. So at this time I explored um, making a book which was titled, I Wait for Catastrophes, which is a reference from a poem. So in this book, I am exploring my relationship to New Orleans and sort of having to emotionally work through having to let go of a place, um, experiencing a disaster like Hurricane Katrina and what that did to my family physically, mentally, um, emotionally, and how that has sort of filtered into the way that I navigate through spaces and how my family approaches um, really life at this point. So I get back into the archive a lot. Um, this is some images from my grandparents. These are my grandparents here when they were living out in New Mexico. And I start looking at our family archive a lot more deeply at this point. And these are also some of the only images that we have um, left. Uh, we lost a lot in the hurricane. So I sort of took this as an opportunity to document my family in a different way um, and really take this as an opportunity for me to think about what the archive meant for black families in particular. Um, when thinking about photography, there's also a lot of conversations that have to happen around accessibility, who originally had access to this technology, originally looking at older forms of photography, a lot of people who had access to this, even with uh, cyanotypes were primarily scientists and botanists, but then you go, um, you know, not too far behind and we're thinking 20th century, 1950s, 1960s, um, there weren't that many Black families who had access to images. And luckily, my family did at the time. And so I really started to think a lot more deeply about what it meant, not just for me to access this archive, but for these pictures to have been taken in the first place at a time where it was not the most accessible for these images to have been created. So it helped me forge a deeper relationship with these images. And it also informed why I sort of switched my work to um, primarily self-portraiture and documenting my family now, which we will get to shortly. So once again, I'm still exploring with just my point and shoot. Um, I have it often just to be taking pictures of family and people I come across. And I did a lot of this when I was back in New Orleans and thinking about how I wanted to move differently 
and how my work would be a translation of these things that I was exploring. Um, this image here is a self-portrait that I took. It's not edited or anything, um, <clears throat> but this is in my cousin's house. Um, she is my grandmother's cousin. And you can see the room is filled with clothes, boxes, and her whole house looks like this. Um, and she actually didn't develop this habit until after Katrina. And so I really took this as an opportunity to think about the long lasting impacts of displacement, of having financial, emotional, physical, and geographic distress and what that did to my family in particular. And this room was sort of a um, synthesis of all of that. So thinking about it in terms of being here in Baltimore, I started to think about how I could explore this and also take advantage of the resources that I had for the little time that I had it left at this point. So I actually- yeah. Can I interrupt you for just one minute? Um, what I think this might be a good question to answer um, now while um, while it's still fresh in, in everyone's mind, but um, we had a question asking if you could explain what you mean by the archive, um, which could be somewhat different for everyone, but I just want to make sure that you have an opportunity to explain that because it seems like such an integral part of what you're talking about. Right. So I'm gonna go back to this picture just to answer that question. But in terms of the archive, I think of it in a couple different ways. I think when thinking about the archive in general, um, an archive in its most basic sense is a preservation of things that also is curated um, in archive. One, let me just say, let me jump back also. I first had my experience working in an archive right out of high school when I was working at the Smithsonian. So I began working at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, where I was exploring adornment practices within the African American community. So that was a lot of work in the Smithsonian's archive, uh, where they had images um, that had been taken by people, um, music, uh, these are posters, uh, propaganda, pins, um, like, you know, pins that you would put on a jacket or a tote bag. Um, pieces of like recipes, uh, all of these things. I mean, really an archive can be composed of a lot of different things, but I specifically started to explore the photo archive. And with that, I mean, I mean, there's archives in so many different places and so many different institutions. I think they function for different reasons and different purposes. Um, but for my archive, I was specifically talking about my own family archive, which are images that have been taken over a long period of time um, that we physically still have and need preservation. So, I'm very intentional with that and also very intentional in my language and saying the archive because most black families don't have an, an archive and I mean that in the sense of they don't have pictures of their family. They don't have pictures of their grandparents or their grandparents parents. Um, they don't have pictures of where they were living or the clothes that they're wearing like there there's not actually a lot of access as black Americans to who you come from. And I don't mean in a sense of like who you came from in Africa. I mean, just two generations ago, who, who were your family? What did they look like? Where were you living? Um, a lot of black people do not have access to that. So with the understanding that I had access to these images, I had physically found them in my family's house in Mississippi, that immediately became my family's archive. Um, so it was, not curated by me, it was curated by just life and what we had access to, what was left. Um, but the culmination of all of that is my archive. That's the archive I'm referencing. In a broader sense, thinking about the archive, um, you know, a library is an archive that functions as an archive. It's, it's just a preservation of history. Um, but you also have to think about who has had access to those spaces and what has been left out of those spaces. Um, because not all, our, all archives are actually representative of everyone. 
Um, so yeah, I will go back now. So moving into a more contemporary sense, um, these are some digital images and this is from my series called The Dollar Menu. So these were taken um, basically <laughs> looking at foods that were advertised specifically as meals and they were purchased by me at the dollar store. So I was looking a lot at food insecurity specifically in Baltimore at the time. Um, I was teaching and a lot of my students at the time were homeless. A lot of them didn't have access to food um, in the areas that they were. The only food that was there was um, really at dollar stores or at corner stores or liquor stores. And in a lot of these communities, you can get a single egg for $2. Um, so the, the access to fresh food or even food that is a reasonable price that's you know, good for you. Um, it's, it's just not the same as say an area like Canton or um, Federal Hill. So I started looking at these areas and purchasing food that was $1 that was being advertised as a meal. And so all of this is photographed here. Um, and the paper that I'm photographing on and the lights that I'm using were all purchased at the dollar store as well. So I was trying to explore a lot of these things with the same constraints that um, I was exploring, which is not really having access to things. And financially, um, I was working within my constraints and seeing what I was able to create as a result of that. So these images um, really started getting me thinking more deeply about uh, larger social issues and how I wanted to comment on those and use photography and sort of a production to sort of jumpstart those conversations. So I'm exploring a few different foods here. Um, and photographing them with really bright colors. And this is a very interesting time for me to sort of create um, and produce uh, an image as opposed to just taking an image. I consciously um, set up these scenarios and I really wanted to use lighting and color to sort of highlight uh, really how like unappetizing these foods are, but really showcase how many people are restricted to nothing but this food. Um, so this was a huge turning point for me in terms of jumping into those conversations. And then getting into my senior year, this is my um, senior studio where I was making a lot of this work. And this sort of jump started, um, I'm gonna go back just a second here. These images on the wall are just sort of test images where I had started jumping into self-portraiture, um, which is what I was going to explore my senior year, but actually ended up at the last minute switching to um, making this body of work called Black Picket Fences. So this was a huge turning point for me in particular, primarily because, uh, primarily because most of my career since graduating has been um, really built off of this project here. And I do want to say that during the time of me making this work, I had almost no support or engagement from <laughs> any of my professors or students. Um, I could not get anyone to talk about this work. And it was very challenging for me, but it was something that I felt was important to talk about. Um, so I just want to make that known because I think there absolutely will be times when you are making work and people are just not responding in a way that might make you feel like it's worth worth pursuing. Um, but I would just say push through that. Um, but with this series here, Black Picket Fences was um, also working with my other thesis. So again, I was a double major and my thesis for humanities was a multidisciplinary analysis of the black suburban landscape. So I was doing this in a sociological and psychological framework. So looking a lot at studies rooted in sociology and psychology. And for this, I started to really think about how me growing up in a predominantly white suburban community contributed to the way that I navigate through spaces, um, my access to different spaces, but also the way that I am perceived by black communities and by white communities. Um, 
And in contrast, I really thought it was important to analyze what it looked like to exist in a black middle class home. I was thinking a lot at this about um, at this time, I was thinking a lot about the representations around blackness and really why I didn't feel compelled or interested in a lot of work made by black artists. Um, even as a black artist, I'd also, I've, I'd also felt not included in the narrative. Um, most narratives surrounding blackness are talking about poverty, we're talking about drugs, talking about, you know, the disbanding of the Black family unit. And I really, although those conversations are important, I really was feeling frustrated with not having any uh, just variance in what it means to be Black in America, especially when you're looking at being Black and having access to more money. Um, so this series, I also worked for the first time with um, Studio Lights and I was working digitally. So up until this point, I'd pretty much been working with film. I was not at all interested in working digitally, but I really started to think about how I could use photography in a different way. Um, and so this was a huge, huge turning point for me. And so with these images, I went into people's homes and basically had them just talk. We had conversations. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions about if these images are staged. None of the images are staged. Um, they are just, they were simply taken when I was just having conversations with these people in their homes. So I allowed them to choose the home uh, or choose the room in the house that they wanted to be photographed in. And they positioned themselves wherever they wanted to sit. Um, I specifically asked that the homes not be cleaned. I asked for nothing to be rearranged and I asked for them to not dress up. So I wanted it to be as accurate as it looks like in their daily lives. And I really wanted this to be some insight into what black middle-class homes look like because if you aren't black or you don't really have friends, like you really probably don't know what these spaces look like nor have you probably even asked yourself. So this house is actually the house that I grew up in in Ellicott City, um, and this is my great uncle. This is really where this project started was with, was with this image. Um, I just came over unexpectedly um, on a weeknight and just asked him to sit here as I talked to him. And I recognized when I took this image that I had not really been able to see my own life reflected back to me. And so I just became obsessed with um, documenting these spaces and also trying to figure out how to use um, simple lighting to sort of illuminate these spaces and, and activate the space in a different way. So between taking those uh, portraits inside, I was also just taking candid images, following um, family and friends around. Um, this actually was a security guard at school and he asked for a student to photograph his wedding um, three days before. And I, I said I would do it for him. And I spent a lot of time with him and his family. And I became very, very interested in sort of contrasting the interior images with just more representations of what these spaces looks like. I wanted to get more information about what these homes look like, the clothes people are wearing, sort of how um, Black families interact and engage with each other. And I specifically wanted to do it looking at suburban areas and middle class areas because I feel there's a huge, huge void of um, what that looks like outside of white communities as well. So this began in Maryland, but has expanded to uh, Virginia, DC, um, Georgia. This image here is taken in Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, and New Mexico. <clears throat> so there's a lot of different um, routes that I'm taking. Some people in the images, some without. Um, people. This is just an image here to get uh, a nice look at like a, a bachelor pad um, down in Georgia. And this was a, a nice time for me also to start 
getting more comfortable with making work that I was personally interested in and that I wanted to see as opposed to what uh, was being expected of me as a Black artist. Um, so I'm looking at a lot of these spaces using natural light and studio light to do so. Um, also using the spaces themselves. Uh, this image was taken in a house, but it's taken through the front door, like one of those typical front doors um, in a lot of suburban homes. I can't think of what it would be called, but they have the weird, you know, just the little, I don't know, the glass is just cut in a in a way there's probably a name for this but this was taken through the front door peering out across the street so i'm physically using the architecture as well to create um, different images um, so there's no digital manipulation there's no manipulation at all um, the glass sort of uh, functions like a kaleidoscope itself so I'm thinking a lot at this point about how I can be looking at these spaces and using the physical spaces themselves and something as simple as light to really um, activate these representations. So this series continues. Um, this is actually a reflection. So you can see this here, this panel is actually a mirror. So he's actually behind me um, <clears throat> and I'm photographing the wall um, to really activate the space. Um, I really wanted these to function as environmental portraits as well. I think that the spaces and um, the rooms themselves were just as important as the people. Um, almost every single time I had displayed this work, the main question that I got asked was, Are, uh, is this the same home? And that was something that became very, very interesting to me is no matter where I was photographing, no matter how far apart, whether it was in the same state, whether they knew each other or not, every single time I showed this work, people automatically assumed that it was taken in the same home. And it made me think a lot about a lot of the areas that have not been touched in terms of what and how people are engaging with these spaces, but also thinking about the fact that I was also noticing a lot of commonalities in how these spaces were being decorated, a lot of the furniture that was chosen, um, also just a, a lack of real design <laughs> or the, you know, like a cohesive design sense. Um, and it sort of opened up a lot more questions about what it means to be uh, a Black American in a middle class lifestyle. And that sort of gets into some more conversations that I go into with some other work. This is still Black Picket Fences. I start um, combining film um, at this point. So it becomes a combination of film and digital. And then I'm going to step into postgrad. So Black Picket Fences was really my final and largest and most cohesive body of work um, my senior year. So up until that point, of course, you can see I'm sort of trying to figure out how to talk about these things and not really knowing how. Um, I'm also going back to experimenting um, when it comes to my postgrad time. So I'm looking again at uh, my foundations, which actually I took uh, sewing classes for about seven years. Um, so I came back to my foundation within clothing and thinking about the importance and role of clothing and this um, sewings in particular as a domestic activity within the home um, and not just the black household, but if you look a lot in um, a lot of feminist movements and really um, I would say the first and second wave in particular, you really get to look at the role of sewing and clothing um, as a real place where women can sort of step up and have a bit more authority in the home. Here I actually start to explore um, really looking at this time I was very interested in exploring the role of uh, prison in relation to African Americans converting to Islam during their time um, incarcerated. So I started researching the history of that and I came across a very interesting history around these blue prayer beads, which are um, found a lot 
in the Carolinas, especially when you're looking at different histories surrounding the Gullah Geechee and just, just different um, tribal sort of rituals that a lot of slaves continued when they were first brought over. That history has been lost a bit now, but a good amount of the slaves that came over were actually Black Muslims. So I started looking at the connection between that and the um, rate of Black Muslims in prison. And I was exploring this through these prayer beads, which uh, were the main indicator for anthropologists in actually connecting this um, history. So I'm still thinking about how I can be exploring these things and trying to step away from photo and sort of came back to it. Um, so I just wanna go over some of how the series Black Picket Fences helped uh, my platform and really me grow in where I wanted to move in my work. So um, Heather uh, noted some of these earlier, but this was my first large award for this project, which was uh, for the uh, Center for the Documentary Arts at Duke University, where I was chosen as the documentarian of color uh, for 2018. And it was for the series Black Picket Fences. So once again, I'm really just showing this because I want to get across. I really was not going to continue making this work. I had absolutely no interest by my community at the time in this work. And because I persisted, it ended up winning me a, a lot of awards and really allowed me to um, just expand in my work and how I wanted to to move um, and to be able to have conversations with a wider audience. Um, it also helped me achieve um, getting chosen as the 2020, one of the 2020 mentors for the Women Photograph Mentor Fellowship, which is a large fellowship composed entirely of really amazing uh, female photographers, female editors, um, and curators, and um, I was chosen for that directly from Black Picket Fences. Um, I also began to get access to a lot more residencies. And again, this is another image from Black Picket Fences. And then it went on to help me win the Sondheim Award. Um, so that was in 2019, and I ended up being the youngest person to ever win the award. It's a $25,000 fellowship, and it also includes a museum exhibition if you get chosen for the final, um, final grouping of artists. So Black Big Offenses is what I submitted, and I ended up getting chosen for the a uh, final selection of artists to show in a museum. This was shown at the Walters Art Museum. And this was the first time that I could really manifest black picket fences and a lot of the, um, really the, the questions for myself that really prompted the creation of this work. So you can see I'm exploring a lot of different things um, from bringing pieces from the archive. This is something uh, specifically exploring racial covenants. Um, and this is a map exploring um, redlining um, here in Baltimore. These are a few different terms that um, I don't have to get into now, but I was specifically, of course, as I referenced before with Black Picket Fences, I was looking a lot at the development of the suburbs. But in order to talk about the development of the suburbs, you have to talk about white flight from the cities and urban communities. And then you really have to get into a lot of the history around racial segregation, around the development of ghettos, around the systemic and really um, legally, both federally and state and on a city local level, the ways that laws have supported the segregation of um, communities and also kept a lot of black people in poverty. Um, if you really take time to look at the history, um, there has been no point in time where there was ever going to be anything beyond racial segregation or ghettos. Um, and now we see it happening again um, with a lot of developments, but this exhibition was really me calling a lot of people out, um, really bringing attention to a lot of historical um, documents that prove a lot of this, um, just to 
give a little insight. These smaller pieces here are actually from a book that was printed by the DC um, group of real estate agents. And it talks about the reasons why black um, home homeowners shouldn't be allowed to purchase in certain areas, things to say to dissuade black people from purchasing in certain communities. Um, it also explores racial covenants where white people would sign um, over um, and basically agree that if they ever sold their homes that they would not sell it to a black family. So I really um, brought a lot of the research in conversation with these pictures and why I, I made the pictures in the first place. So this also included a neon sign that I had created, which was just displayed at um, Memorial Episcopal, which is a church here in the city in Bolton Hill. That church is actually one of the churches of the, the founders of that church actually fiscally supported the creation of two of the Confederate statues that were removed here in the city a few years ago. Um, so this sign was just um, displayed there, but it was a part of that show originally. And then I start to move into not just making my own work, but curating work and curating conversations that I thought were important to have. Um, so a lot of this is happening specifically around trying to get more diversity in what is represented in terms of being a person of color here in America. Um, so this was a show that I curated um, at the parlor and it was called Face Value and it explores primarily lens-based work that is looking at what it means for um, artists of color um, to be first generation Americans navigating culturally both in an American identity and the identity and values and culture of the homes that they're growing up in. Um, and this image is taken by a photographer, Nadia Nakorda, and she explores um, being biracial. She is a uh, Black South African, and then her um, other side is Filipino. So she explores a lot of that through images of her family, um, images of herself and her body, um, and pulling from um, different environmental aspects of these landscapes. Um, so her work is very, very interesting. And that was the first time that I started to uh, really curate conversations around these things outside of my own work. I also formed Shades Collective, which is, as you see here, we're a Baltimore-based collective dedicated to giving space to Black and Indigenous people of color in personal and or professional creative pursuits in the arts and humanities. This was primarily the result of having absolutely no support and feeling very exhausted by trying to navigate these conversations in art, but specifically within academia, which is a very um, white space often. And so we created a platform to focus on uh, people of color that are in these spaces uh, at the intersection of art, humanities, and academia, and really don't often get the space to talk about themselves or to talk about their work outside of having to be the token person to talk about, you know, being that one person of color in the room. So we really have a space where you can feel empowered as a person of color to talk about what you want to talk about and not have to feel like it has to be um, about race. So moving back into my work and sort of wrapping this up here, um, this is when I really start to jump back into figuring out how I want to talk about a lot of these things. And at this time, I'm also thinking about the ethics around photography, um, what it means for me to go into communities, even as a Black woman, what does it mean for me being financially more stable? What does it mean for me to access lower income black communities and then to profit off of those images? Um, it doesn't really ethically make sense nor does it feel good or make sense. Uh, so I started to uh, really stop photographing other people. Um, and also I just want to say all of the images uh, in Black Picket Fem 
black picket fences um, and the images that I take of other people, those are images that I do not sell. Um, so most of this work in this time um, was also me trying to figure out how to build and sustain a practice, but not selling um, work and not creating work for the purpose of being sold. So I started looking at myself and I started looking a lot at what self-portraiture could do for me and how I could explore these things through self-portraiture. So a photographer that I was referencing for this series was Cindy Sherman. If you're not familiar with her, she got really big early on in photography for really uh, curating self-portraits. And a lot of her self-portraits really were production. She uh, put on wigs and uh, went to different locations and she photographed herself. And I was really thinking about my ability to do the same as a black woman and how I would always have to answer my blackness before my womanness. And so I sort of made a, sort of a parody of that using a, a wig in one of the first, uh, that referenced one of the first images and one of the biggest images that she's known for. Um, and I created some self portraits and these were toned with tea and coffee. So again, I'm sort of referencing older um, methods within photography, but using what is accessible to me and also what is uh, least destructive for the planet. So I'm looking again at identity. You can start to see I'm, I'm looking at identity a lot more at this point. Um, sort of questioning what it means for me to be African American and really what it means for me to be navigating in this landscape, not being fully, um, not really having a connection to being African, but also not really feeling proud of being American. Again, a lot of this is, a lot of this is happening with self portraiture. Um, and exploring different methods of um, trying to really produce uh, scenes and scenarios and commenting on stereotypes at the same time. So I'm looking a lot at stereotypes that a lot of Black women are faced with in terms of clothing and for, in terms of performance um, with your body, uh, body language, the way you're talking, uh, terms you're using. So I was really questioning uh, and bringing to the forefront stereotypes and how I had to navigate through them without even having any real connection to um, these aspects of culture. Um, <clears throat> so this gets into some other work where um, I was living in Thailand for some time where I felt for the first time that I actually didn't have to think about my blackness. Um, and it was the first time I felt I was able to actually engage with the space outside of thinking about what it meant for me to have to do it as a black person. So I really started to look a lot at landscape a lot more. Um, I started to get back to color, um, photography, film photography. And it was the first time I took a break from talking about these heavy social issues. And it was a direct result of me actually being outside of America and not having to think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can see the shift in my work um, at this time. And then coming back again, I get into um, self portraiture once again, but thinking about how I can more directly involve other people in this conversation. And I start to use fabric. So this is from um, my series, A Brown Millennial, where I am looking at a vintage American textile collection, uh, which was marketed as a vintage like Americana sort of thing. And um, there was really no representation of blackness, black people, black contributions, black history, none of it was represented in the textile collection at all. Um, so I actually brought some of the fabric from there and sort of juxtaposed myself within these images and really started to think more deeply about what it meant for me as a black woman to be navigating through these largely white spaces um, that have contributed to who I am as a person, but have never reflected me. Um, so the images are displayed on to the fabric, the same fabric that I am photographing myself in. And um, this is when I start to get a little bit 
uh, larger in terms of how I am approaching my installations, how the images are in conversation with these symbols, and then how other people can sort of insert themselves into this. Um, no matter who you are, you'll see these fabrics and you will, of course, have your own um, associations with them. So um, it also opened up the conversation a lot more. And then I sort of get into these cyanotype images and not cyanotypes. Uh, these are collodions, which are tin types. So these are printed onto sheets of metal. And it's a very, uh, it's an older form of photography, but here I am looking a lot at the history of photography itself. Being a photographer, I really start to dissect the medium and recognize a lot of the inconsistencies and quite honestly, just a lack of development in the chemistry itself. To this day, um, there's really not much knowledge around how to take these images and how to accurately um, represent black skin. So the shades that are shown in the photos are probably about five to six shades darker than um, I am or my family is but I thought it was very, very important to use this method to directly talk about that, but at the same time, pay homage and sort of have it be an ode to uh, photography itself. Most black people that you see photographed in these images, if you are looking at archives, were slaves and those images were commissioned by slave masters and plantation owners. So often they were taken to display their property. Um, so I was directly in conversation with that um, by using the same process and sort of positioning my own family in this um, arrangement. So you see here, this is my grandmother on the left and my mother on the right. And um, at the same time, I'm actively trying to build our own archive. Um, and I often say uh, this series is called an archive of our own, which directly references uh, my conscious decision to build our family archive and to make sure that we have images um, to just document our existence. So I'm also exploring black matrilineal relationships here. Um, and really at the same time, I'm recognizing there's not many representations of black women um, and the relationships between uh, black family members. Um, I come from a family that is predominantly single black women. Um, I was raised by a single mother and um, she is darker than I am. So our experiences with each other also were very different because of that. So I'm exploring a lot of that through our body, um, through shape and through space and with this older method of documenting. So these are about eight by 10 inch uh, metal plates. And there's three of us here. And then I have this series called American Pie, uh, where I am sort of looking at the presence of the American flag and just this idea of American Americana and sort of this feeling of uh, Big Brother and me documenting that through different landscapes as a black woman. Um, so of course I am living here in Baltimore, but my family is originally from Louisiana and Mississippi. So I'm exploring a lot of this through the Southern landscape and trying to represent um, sort of these mundane spaces, but how I perceive them as a black person navigating through these spaces and how overwhelming um, <clears throat> and sort of just, uh, just a, a, there's a heavy weight with the image of the American flag being uh, black in America. So I really start to explore that through these landscape images. Um, taking a lot more portraits in these spaces. Um, this was taken in Forsyth, Georgia, which is one of the cities that uh, pretty much evaded a lot of the civil rights movements in the South and um, single-handedly in a night ran out all 1300 black residents out of the city. Um, and this happened uh, back in the 1950s. So um, once again, I sort of just am looking at uh, things that happened in the past and sort of looking at contemporary uh, representations of those spaces and the people that are inhabiting them.
And I'm doing this all across um, the country. My mother also is originally from New Mexico, so I'm exploring a lot of this um, in that landscape as well. And then I just wanted to have some uh, suggested readings here, um, just in case you all are interested in looking at what I read and how a lot of this influenced my work. So the first is Shifting, which is the double lives of Black women in America. It is written by two Black women. Um, one is a writer and the other is a psychologist, uh, but they specifically look at the impact of having to navigate uh, Blackness and womanhood in America, uh, both in family life, in church life, and more specifically in corporate life. I definitely, definitely recommend it, especially if you are not Black, because it gives a lot of insight into the never ending work and emotional, mental and physical labor that is done by black women and how it takes place in ways that you might not even recognize um, that you could directly be contributing to. Um, there's Black Picket Fences, which inspired my own series, Black Picket Fences, which looks at African Americans in white suburban communities. There's Not in My Neighborhood, How Big a Tree Shaped a Great American City. <clears throat> and that specifically looks at a lot of the history I talked about in Black Picket Fences surrounding redlining um, and just a lot of methods used in residential racial segregation, uh, but it specifically actually analyzes Baltimore. So I think that anyone who is living here absolutely should um, read this book. Um, if you have a, feel like you have a certain insight into the city, I feel like this completely breaks that up and I don't think it allows you to look at the city the same way. Um, you can actually get a huge insight into what these neighborhoods used to be, how they came to be, and um, Loyola is also a, a huge um, space that uh, is sort of talked about in this book, so I think it's very helpful. Um, How Racism Takes Place by George Lipsitz, where he actually looks at um, architecture and urban planning and really the role that that makes in keeping Black people in poverty and also looking at um, really the ignorance around, like the ignorance that whiteness affords and how you don't have to um, really analyze these things. Um, and George Lipsitz is a white man himself, so it is a different perspective um, that he's coming from, but I think it's, it's like those voices are needed. And then the white gaze, uh, which really looks at photography and how um, really you aren't always conscious of how you are consuming bodies that aren't white. But if you look at a lot of patterns within representations of black bodies, um, you'll start to see how racism is embedded in something as simple as um, an image. So that is all for me. And um, just in case you want to keep in touch, um, here is my email, which is akia at akiabrown.com. If you have any questions, thoughts, um, I'm always here. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at akiabrion. Um, and then my website is akiabrion.com. And thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. It's I've been awesome hearing you talk about your whole progression. I've just absolutely loved it. And the ones, the saddest thing about the virtual experience is that we can't actually clap for you in the in the way that I really wish we could. But um, know that we are all clapping in our minds. Um, I also want to encourage anyone who has any questions to please let us know. And um, maybe Heather, if you wanted to ask anything or get us started while people sort of formulate those questions, please feel free to do that. And in the chat or in the Q&A, either is fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Akia. That was wonderful. Um, I think uh, I think one of the first things I wanna ask about is you talked a lot about accessibility and I um, right have this like very insider knowledge of like your development through the arts, like, we work together um, and that's where I got to know you. But I really wanted to talk about that because I think that's so important of like working within the limits that you were given, right? Like when you're, when you were in school, like you were working at points like five different jobs at the same time, just to keep afloat and like keep your practice going. And it was something we certainly talked about a lot about how, you know, your access 
to being able to even make your art was so different from that of your peers. So I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about this and also talk a little bit about the, um, you didn't say this, this term, but like the room of silence of like coming into a classroom and being like, hey, here's my work about race and everybody kind of sitting there being like, yikes, I don't know what to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thinking about that and um, accessibility, I met Heather when I was work study, which I was placed in the crib, which was our um, just the where you would check out equipment uh, for the photo department. And um, at that time, I was working multiple jobs. I was working five um, jobs and I was a full time student at the same time. So that was something that did sort of um, affect my ability to make work and to be present because I was really trying to um, work to not only pay for school, but to pay for supplies, to pay to print images, to pay for film, um, to pay for chemistry. Um, and then I also had, you know, I was a double major, so I had to pay for textbooks and really just also to live. Um, <laughs> So it uh, definitely affected my ability to make work because I was spending so much time um, working and then I had to spend time doing homework um, for a lot of my liberal arts classes, which was a lot of reading, it was a lot of writing that I didn't really have an endless amount of time outside of class to be in the studio and to ruminate over these thoughts. Um, and also art school, college in general, you operate on such a just insane and unrealistic timeline of how quickly you're expected to make work and then turn it over. Um, there's no other no other time when you're going to be asked to, to, to just make work um, under those circumstances. So for me, that was very difficult. So when I was in the studio and when I was, um, when I did have time, I had to be very intentional with it. And I sort of had to know what it was that I wanted to make, um, even if I didn't have the time to work through the, the reasonings behind that. Um, which I think thinking about work is just as important, even more so than actually making the work. Um, and that was really the time that I lacked. Um, you can take a picture easily and, you know, you could do whatever with that picture after. But um, it was difficult because with the Room of Silence, um, as Heather mentioned, um, so there's actually a documentary called The Room of Silence, and it was made by a group of students from RISD, which is the Rhode Island School of Design. And a few years ago, um, a lot of students sort of banded together and documented uh, their own experience being in art school and feeling absolutely unseen. And it came out with this term uh, called the room of silence where you're pretty much in a room, um, you're in a crit. And um, as soon as there's any sort of mention of race, there is just silence, there's no feedback. Um, and that was something I was experiencing where we would have a crit Mind you, these are um, six hour classes that we have. The shortest class that we had was three hours, which were our academic classes. Um, so also don't believe that our students are lazy because there's, <laughs> there's so much work that goes into it. But um, these were six hour classes and it was nothing but creating work. And I would experience as did uh, many other students outside of my department also, you will spend all of this time and energy making work and wanting to hear feedback, not just from students, but from professors. And there are conversations endlessly about dogs and puppies, which like, don't get me wrong, they're cute. Um, but you know, it was something where we started to realize, all right, so people can talk endlessly about gender issues, people can talk endlessly about the challenges of being a woman, people can talk about um, their strained relationship with their mother, but as soon as a person of color does it, and we have to talk about race, there is no, there's, there's no words at all, there's no feedback, there's nothing. Um, and that is something that I think is very difficult and discouraging for a lot of people because 
also school is not cheap. It's very, very expensive. And at the end of the day, not everyone is getting an equal education because if you're there to make art and no one is there to talk to you about your art so you can know what to what to what other people think, um, what's working, what's not working, um, you're not really getting anything out of it. So, so that was definitely a situation where, and a huge reason why I did almost um, leave um, school because I was spending so much time and energy putting my soul into this work and having really no engagement with it. Um, and I think talking about it now and um, as some time has passed, I know a lot of people feel barriers in talking about race and not being um, a person of color, but I think it's very important to know that it's actually more detrimental and more harmful to not say anything. And I think what I wanted and what a lot of my peers wanted was to have honest conversations about, okay, you're a white person engaging with this conversation where I'm talking about my blackness. What does it mean to you? Like, what do you feel about it? What are you thinking about it? And it can't just be silence because we, you know, it, that just, that's not real. Even if it's, I don't understand this work, that is more, uh, that's more beneficial than nothing. Um, so yeah, that was that was a bit on the room of of silence, which hopefully it is you know not still a big a big thing. Along those lines, I was going to ask because you know there's been a few um, you know there's there's been a few. Th things at MICA recently along along race issues. And I and I'm curious if, you know, if you feel like you sort of opened up a line of conversation for future students there, or if you how you feel your impact might have um, given others hope or courage to sort of, you know, speak out. Um I I don't really think I like on an individual level had any sort of role in that. I mean, I don't personally feel that way. Um, I think that the work um, of my collective, Shades Collective, has probably had more of a role in that. Um, but, you know, it's something that has been an issue my entire time with MICA. Um, I mean, even looking at MICA, it is just a few blocks away from a lot of largely like black low income areas of the city. Um, and it was just a few blocks away from um, Penn Ave when everything sort of took off with Freddie Gray and the um, uprisings around that time. And that happened my freshman year. Um, and that happened actually during finals week. And I've never, I've never ever before felt tension in the air like I did that day. And I felt that before I even knew what was going on. Um, that was also the same year when um, in my dorm, in my freshman year dorm, someone carved kill all black people into the elevators at school. That became a huge sort of situation. Um, there was, a lot, there was a lot of things happening like that. And there was also things that had happened at Loyola that I'd heard about. There's things that had happened at a lot of other schools. Um, I don't necessarily think that I personally contributed to working around um, this work, but I do think I was vocal. Uh, but I think that any like student of color at the time was vocal about it. Um, I don't think I would take sole credit though. <laughs> I do actually, I want to quickly point to um, kind of like a lineage within that uh, conversation of like, um, for those of you who who aren't super aware of Micah and like don't know what has transpired over the past like several years, um, but a couple of years ago, uh, the Black Student Alliance um, or Black Student Union um, had staged a protest um, on the stairs uh, regarding the history of uh, MICA and its admittance of Black students and also Black students who, for a number of different reasons, dropped out, had to leave. Um, this work is also very much reflected within uh, a couple artists that come to mind, uh, Dion Moses, um, 
who I think is graduating this year in curatorial studies from their MFA program. But her work entirely looks at the Black archive in relation to MICA. And also it's on a larger scale, like a commentary about these kind of like specialized schools like art schools where this is a space that um, is a white space, right? Like it comes from a history of white spaces. The art history that is taught is white art history. It is not world art history. It is much more like specific to the Western world. So it comes from this very, very long lineage. And then of course, like Akia lived here during um, the uprising. I did too, like that tension was so, so thick and it was, Baltimore was a different place that day and every day thereafter, not to say that there are not like, there's not this huge history that happened before it. It was just a turning point. It was more, and I, I don't want to minimize anything that happened, but it was kind of like a straw that broke the camel's back, but there were really heavy straws in there. And just to just to add on to that also, I think a lot of this tension has come up because there's often the assumption that because it's art school or because it's technically liberal, um, that there is no conversation or issue around race. And a lot of this sort of manifested because um, you know, you have a lot of people that are like, I'm not racist, you know, I'm voting for this person and I believe in this, but they're actively um, ignoring and be, really being a part of the problems that people face because they are people of color. Um, so that was something that also came up a lot is what does it mean to be existing in these quote unquote liberal communities that um, don't also want to acknowledge the own like their own white privilege within that and um, how the experiences are just not the same so great uh, do we have any questions from any of the attendees not at this moment oh wait oh, wait we have one <laughs> yes um, from Nelson, this is a question that came to me earlier during your presentation on Black inmates converting to Muslim. Uh, just curious as to what sparked that interest for you? Um, so for me, what sparked that was actually, I ended up taking a course on um, Islamic history and it was sort of just like an introductory course to Islamic history. It was honestly the first and only course to my knowledge that was really outside of um, any like white Eurocentric history. So immediately I was just interested because I really didn't care about the Baroque period um, or, you know, learning about like uh, just the same things. I just wasn't interested. Um, so I became very interested in that. And actually at the time, the professor that I had um, had recently been on the news um, for uh, pretty much getting, not pretty much, like she was dragged off of a plane and it went viral um, online. And as her being my professor, um, she was receiving a lot of death threats. I honestly didn't, I wasn't even allowed to know who she was um, being my professor um, until the first day in class. Um, and so even her having to navigate around not even being able to fully use her identity to teach the course um, as a direct result of a lot of the Islamophobia and hate that she was receiving, um, <clears throat> it made me look a lot deeper into these things. Um, and with her in particular, she's done so, 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 so much amazing work. Um, she was also the I had two professors of color, which were women, uh, but two professors of color in my entire collegiate career, and she was a second. So I was just automatically more drawn to her, and I felt like she um, was she was already more attentive to what I was interested in, um, just because she was occupying a different experience. Um, 
And with her, she sort of gave me a huge amount of support in terms of the work that I was doing and my research and how I could take what I was learning and um, think about its role in my own day to day life. And so <clears throat> also, at this time, uh, one of my jobs was as a nonprofit teacher where I was teaching throughout the city. I was in shelters and jails, transitional homes. Um, and a lot of these communities, a lot of people that I was engaging with were Black Muslims. Um, and I had personally never really had an understanding of its role within Baltimore's history. Um, and there are certain areas in the city, I'm not sure how many of you have been to those areas, but there are certain areas where there are very large uh, pockets of Black Muslims. Um, and it's very visible. Um, you can tell with the food, the languages that are being spoken, um, it's and it's also a very huge um, it's a huge presence that actually helps a lot with the transition of immigrants in the city, specifically in East Baltimore. There's a lot of Islamic organizations that are specifically helping the huge um, Latinx community that is coming in, especially from um, El Salvador, uh, Nicaragua, like all, all these places um, that something as simple as having a translator to help you read how, um, like what your bill says, what your water bill says, or what your child's like school form is saying, like they are directly um, supporting that community of immigrants and it's largely being run by the Islamic community um, who's also supporting other um, Islamic immigrants. So I just became very, very aware of this community, but I became very interested. For me particularly, I had, um, I have a cousin who is my same age, who is currently in prison. And he's been awaiting trial for about two years now. And his bond is set at $3 million. And we have had a huge, huge sort of conversation about this in my family. And for him right now, the only thing that has sort of been helping him stay afloat is um, Islam. And he learned it in prison. So um, I just immediately became very interested in it. I had access to someone who um, was a practicing Muslim um, and could give me also a different insight into the way that the media and propaganda has sort of really hijacked the, and I don't use that term like in that way, but you know, sort of uh, shifted the way that we perceive Islam as a religion and um, really what it means uh, to navigate through that and being black as well. And the racial discrimination that is faced even within Islam for black Muslims. Um, so it really just tied into my work on a, like a larger scale. And in a way, I, my work, I think at this point sort of functions um, within journalism where I very much just explore different topics that I think just need a little bit more uh, work and research and um, just a little bit more time. So that was something that um, I'd, I'd always been interested in and had an opportunity to, to dive in in a way that would also keep me more con considerate of how I was doing it as well, uh, which I think is also something important is if you are um, wanting to make work about something, you want to learn something, um, learn it from the people who are, are in it um, and do so with consideration for them as well. So I, I knew there was no point I would be able to make this work and feel okay in making that work if I wasn't coming from it um, with people who I was talking about. Great. Um... So there's another question in the Q&A. As African-Americans begin to move into white space, do you feel like people feel uncomfortable in their own homes? The homes in Black Picket Fences series struck me as like, at, struck me as very spare. Um, also just quick note, uh, not related to the talk, but to my 1215 class, we're obviously not meeting because we're running out of time. So um, 
<clears throat> do they do they strike the or Issa, they strike you as spare is sparse? Is that um Ellen, can you elaborate on that question? Um, maybe for the first part, just address, do you think as African-Americans begin to move into these like predominantly white spaces, um, do you think they feel kind of uncomfortable in their own home? Is it a point of, is it a point of conscious reflection for those that you photographed? Um, yeah, so no, I don't feel like it's a point of conscious reflection. Um, I think quite honestly, there's, there's, there's so much work that goes into even attaining a home as a black person um, that I feel like decorating is like the last thing on the list. And I think it's sort of just, it's a larger conversation about privilege and really thinking about um, like the levels of privilege. And there's, there's always a hierarchy of, I, I don't feel like there should be a hierarchy of oppression, but I do feel like there should be a hierarchy of privilege because there, there are levels to it. Um, and yeah, I do think that a lot of the homes are, I mean, I don't know. It's like, what, what does sparse even mean to you? I, I think at the end of the day, um, there's not many black homeowners in these areas and spaces I am examining that have actually the time or the funds to actually think about design and interior design um, just as something for fun or even to be able to support. Um, like to be able to acquire the home is one thing, but then, you know, there's a lot of situations where you can get a home and spend all of your money trying to get the home and have no um, ability to really furnish it or to even think about like, how do you want to design this space? How do you want it to feel? Um, instead of like, okay, what's the most accessible thing that I can use as a bed or as a table or to put this up on the wall? Um, I think also that gets into a larger conversation about the barriers with being black and home owning. Often it is more expensive for you to purchase um, as, um, as a black homeowner. Um, there's often spaces you can't access. Uh, there's often more fees that you have to pay depending on the area that you're getting. Um, often the loans are at much higher interest rates. Um, so, so I mean, there's, there's so many things that go into um, these spaces, but I don't think any of these people felt uncomfortable in their home because it's, it's their home. Um, I think you might feel uncomfortable, but I think that they feel fine. <laughs> Great. I, I really like what you just brought up about um, kind of interior design and privilege. And it's something I think we don't really think. I, I think it's back to a larger topic within your work where what we see in a space, how we define the ideas of home, um, how those neighborhoods look, how those streets are structured, where the churches are. Um, it is all just so deeply important to that conversation of like, what is the history and how can I cultivate the history from what I'm seeing in the contemporary? Um, so yeah, I actually don't have a follow-up question. I did like uh, earlier in the talk, you talked about sustainability and photography, which has always um, been kind of like a funny, interesting thing to me because it's probably like one of the least sustainable practices in the arts, aside from maybe like if you paint a lot with like spray paint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about environmentalism and photography and like the kind of difficult line that we all kind of toe in that pursuit? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, in high school, when I moved to California, I moved to a very like hippie school in the middle of the valley outside of the Bay Area. And the huge emphasis in that was living off the land. And a big part of living off the land was understanding the importance of living off the land. And that was really my first introduction into um, 
sustainability as not just something to study, but really a way of life and what it means to um, really exist with the uh, being conscious of that. Um, and it was also the first time when I was able to directly sort of make the connection between Hurricane Katrina and climate change. And I think often in looking at a lot of environmental disasters, even looking at um, Hurricane Sandy and how that rocked New York a few years ago, um, it's not often that we stop and think about, you know, just weather patterns and how they are directly related to climate change. And then thinking about climate change as it relates to environmental racism and climate justice, which are um, things that sort of get into another area that I could go on and on about. Um, but it is very, very obvious that low income communities of color are often the first to be impacted by the effects of climate change. And I say this looking at um, New Orleans, looking at Houston, looking at much of the Carolinas, um, most of the communities that are the most impacted have been low income black and brown communities um, who don't really have the resources to rebuild also, which is a huge, a huge factor in this. Um, and when you really start to understand the intersections between climate change and how you are living in your daily life, um, it becomes very hard to move the same way and to not be considerate of it. Um, and I have, um, you know, lived in, of course, New Orleans, which we have experienced a lot with the hurricane. Um, when I moved to California, um, I was living in the Bay Area, which has been just in the past few years swamped by uh, wildfires. Um, it was the first time I had woken up to red skies and ash falling from the sky, and that was just a norm. Um, and when we moved here, I grew up in Ellicott City, which has just been ravaged by flooding. Um, it's not at all the same place. So I really have had um, no choice but to be conscious of it because all of the places I have called, called home um, have severely been impacted by these changes. And at only 25, I've had to be confronted by this um, at numerous points. So when I started thinking about my work, um, also I majored in it. So I was just, you know, thinking about it all the time. Um, and when I started to think about my work, I was like, good Lord, you know, I'm like printing and using all this paper. And, you know, it's like, there's, there's, um, there's consequences to consuming all this paper and what you have to destroy to get this paper, how quickly that is not being replenished and put back into the earth. You know, thinking about the inks that you're using and how that actually is washing into the oceans and not really being disposed of in a proper way, thinking about something even like framing and okay, do I really need to use a wooden frame um, and not think about where it's coming, where the materials are being sourced, who is actually sourcing those materials, what they're getting paid, um, if it's even safe for them to be doing it. And then thinking about as a consumer, how you are directly supporting um, these things by, by purchasing and by making the demand uh, for these things grow. So I also became very conscious of um, what I was consuming, how I was doing so, and how it was going to be something I was thinking about in my practice. Um, as cool as it is to be working with a lot of different chemicals and, and just you know printing to the largest scale. Um, I've honestly scaled down a lot of that. And if I do not have to print, I do not print. I, if I do not need to frame, I do not frame. Um, and if I do, I'm reusing frames. I try not to just buy, buy, buy and, you know, throw away. Um, I think also in terms of um, thinking about access to who is able to do these things is not cheap to be a practicing artist in the sense of like, I genuinely do support myself with my practice. Um, and it is not cheap to be um, a photographer. There's 
two mediums that are the most expensive to maintain and it's painting is one and photography is the other. Um, and really thinking about that um, sustainability, not just in an environmental sense, but in a fiscal sense, what does that mean for me? And how can I sort of change my practices to make sure that this is something I can sustain long term, um, but not be, you know, just mindlessly, um, I guess, contributing to the destruction of a lot of a lot of systems. So it was a long, long winded answer. But <laughs> That's great. Okay. Yeah, it gives it really gives us all, all a lot, a lot to think about. And um, as this whole talk has done. So I, I really appreciate it. But um, I do think we should wrap up and um, and thank you so much for for joining us and for um, spending the time telling us about your experiences and your work and and it's been an incredible um, value to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Uh, yeah. Oh, we have it. Thank you for sharing your amazing work from one of the yeah. attendees. So. Cool.